Welcome back. <laughs> Last volume was a bit of a trip, considering just how much context was squeezed in. Learning about noble politics, how they weave plots, Wilfried's incompetence, Haas's punishment just being decided, as well as Rosemine's unsuccessful gathering attempt. So how does Part 3, Volume 3 follow that up? An introduction to nobles at large, a splash of action, lore for the winter ingredient, Haas actually being punished as well as capping us off with a precarious situation involving Rosemine gathering her spring ingredient. Less heavy on the lore, more focused on the plot at hand, as Part 3 is picking up steam and rolls on into the main plot threads of this story. Before we dig in proper to this volume, why don't you hit the subscribe button, I'm sure there's an animation going on around here somewhere. Helps my channel out quite a bit. Obligatory plug is obligatory. Picking up at the prologue this volume, we have Fran hearing about Rosemine's discussion with Wilma at the end of the last book. She's asking Fran what his thoughts are about getting more attendance, and Fran.exe crashes for a moment before rebooting and asking what she means exactly. She tells him what Wilma said, that she's understaffed and her attendants are overworked, and that she's also already talked to Ferdinand about this, since in the temple it's the high priest's job to handle the hiring and firing of attendants. As we already know, Bezewans just pretty much did as he pleased, so Ferdinand is taking that job back now that Fatty's out of the picture. Fran's interested in what the high priest said because he's to serve him, still thinks pretty highly of him, and even prioritizes his views over Rosemine's at times. Ferdinand says it's up to her, hence why she's asking Fran, since money isn't an issue for her anymore due to her allowance and bishop's pay. So Fran says that she should bring on a few, one for the workshop since Gil is essentially running it, and there are times he's gonna need to be away at the Gilberta company. And she's definitely gonna need another for her chambers since Fran is swamped with paperwork. He compares the management styles of Ferdinand and Rosemine, how she'll ask for opinions from her attendants and allow them a lot of discretion, while Ferdinand takes on attendants in mass and puts them through the ringer. Whoever lasts gets to stay, with a flunking rate of about 90%. So Fran expertly points out the issue with her chambers, as Monica and Nicola are basically doing chef's work most of the time. He says that she should hire a new chef to free up the girls to do attendant work, even if Nicola enjoys her work there a lot which means Rosemine has an idea. She heads down to the orphanage and asks Lutz and Gil for their thoughts on who would do best, and both throw out the name Fritz, a former attendant of Sheiksa, who due to his master being a spoiled brat turned into a very patient, capable person, meaning he'll be a perfect backup for Gil. With that decided, Fran reports to Ferdinand, and he's annoyed that she's allowing Nicola to work in the kitchen still. The issue there is attendants tend to be jacks of all trades when it comes to work, so focusing them on the kitchen is pretty damn odd, since generally they're there to take care of their masters as well as do paperwork. Now Fran points to Christine, who let her attendants focus on music and art, so there's at least a precedent for unorthodox work in the temple, because at the end of the day, it's all about entertaining their masters. And that's when Ferdinand points out Fran, thinking about others so much, has let Rosemine poison his mind. He then offers up Zom for assistance now that he has some free time to train new attendants. And Fran notices that the same is going for Ferdinand too. He's also letting Rosemine poison his mind with kindness. Yes and no, Ferdinand certainly does think about one person more than others. And that person is Rosemine. Over to Rosemine proper, it's time to improve the printing press. Before bed, Rosemine receives a letter requesting a meeting from Benno for Ingo. We'll learn later how big of an ordeal this is, since a craftsperson never meets with a noble in person, especially someone of Ingo's standing. But the reason why he's doing this is super important to his future. All because of that business with the monastery. Since it was such a rush job, Rosemine tasked Benno and Gustav to handle it. So they're the ones who approached the carpentry guild to dish out jobs. Now typically they would have contacted Ingo, who's her exclusive workshop. And then he would have been the one to take it to his guild to request and divvy up work. Now that didn't happen, as we know. And he was just tossed the work like any other workshop. Which calls his position into question, leading others to think that she was dissatisfied with his work. That's not good for a new workshop with such close ties to an important noble. So now that the monastery is done and improving the printing press is his next task, he's planning on throwing himself into it. Only problem is, Lutz talking about the improvement process leads him to believe that someone knows what an improved press is already like, and Ingo wants to skip that whole trial and error phase to secure his place. He pressures Lutz and, by proxy, Benno for an audience, when he learns that it's Rosemine who knows, and he wants to probe her for details, even though she's a noble and his rudeness could get him killed. So let's fast forward to the meeting. Benno delivers the greeting while Ingo does his damnedest not to make a wrong move. They then go into the hidden room where Benno tells him to relax and just talk to Rosemine. First order of business is her exclusivity, which she says that he has. Yeah, she's never been displeased with his work, 
so she signs a paper saying that he has her exclusive business. Next comes the printing press, which Rosemine knows what a finished one looks like, but she can't really describe it too well, and the whole thing isn't made of wood. Also doesn't really help that she doesn't know the word for leverage and is doing a bad job explaining that too. So Ingo gets one thing from this meeting. She has an idea for a better press in her head, but lacks the expertise to describe it well. So they call in the Smiths to work out how this all fits together and collaborate. Sounds simple, but this is a first in this world. Different professions don't collaborate like this. Yeah, a carpenter is going to order nails or hinges, but a smith and carpenter don't work together to create a finished piece. The reason being, who gets the credit and pay? So Zack and Johan show up, and the first official meeting of the Gutenbergs comes to order. This becomes a huge brainstorming session where ideas flow, as Rosemine tells them all the things that she needs. And ultimately it comes down to Zack's going to design the new printing press. Now he doesn't really want to because, again, he's not going to be the one making it, so why is he going to design it? It's simple. Rosemine's offering to buy the blueprints and that's another unheard of idea. Blueprints are for personal or workshop use during the planning stage. People don't view them as a product into themselves. But Zack is on board with this since selling schematics is something that's never been done before. It's going to give him some credit to guild. Johan's going to produce the intricate metal pieces, and Ingo will build the shell to house the press and assemble the thing. They're all brimming with enthusiasm now to get this press made, but she's not done dishing out jobs. As she has Johan make some more spacing for printing, and Ingo makes some more typesetting stuff. Yeah, they're all going to be pretty busy over winter. <laughs> Later, Zack finishes the schematics, and she invites everyone back to look it over from their perspective. Johan jumps on the most complicated one, of course. But Ingo's wisdom comes in, where he tells them to look at each of the designs and evaluate it on its merits. This leads to an amalgamation of all the designs so far, ultimately to create the best press they can over winter. So to reiterate, Rosemine just introduced a ton of crazy ideas here. Collaboration between professions to hone expertise, selling intellectual property, and casually dropping that springs could be used to create mattresses. So the technological revolution has only just begun. But there's no time for that because winter is upon us. That means Rosemine has to go to the castle for socializing, but more importantly is the introduction of baptized children that year to noble society in the form of a debut. Each kid performs a harspiel song on stage before the 800-some nobles of Arenfest. Rosemine's noticing the migration of nobles from their provinces to the noble quarter after the harvest festival. Ferdinand's having her move to the castle after the winter baptisms in the lower city. Rosemine's also aware at this point that once Ferdinand is done training some blue robes, specifically two named Camphor and Freetag, recommended by Rosemine to take up some of Ferdinand's temple work. As well as his training of some grey robes, he'll be sending Zom on over to Rosemine. We'll learn more about Zom later in this part, that unlike Arno, he actually likes Rosemine quite a bit because she's the only person who's actively reduced Ferdinand's workload. So Rosemine goes to her director's chambers to meet Effa and Tuli for a new hairpin, and this is Fran delegating some of his work, as he has Monica and Fritz follow her. Yeah, this is their training on monitoring her health. In the hidden room, she's presented with a new hairpin, and it's a perfect match for her winter debut outfit, one that looks a lot like Santa's, considering the divine colors and a preference for fur. Nobody in this world is going to get that reference though, so she's stuck wearing it. The topic then shifts to Effa mentioning how happy Gunther is guarding the priests, and also how thankful they are for the bonuses, despite it all being blown at bars. Also, they do talk about how Camille is doing. She presents them with a new picture book and a toy for him, both as gifts before ending their meeting. Before she knows it, Autumn's coming of age and the winter baptisms are here, meaning it's time to go to the noble quarter. Ferdinand hands out a metric fuck ton of work to his two assistant blue robes and has them set up the dedication ritual while they're gone. Also worth noting, all of Ferdinand's confers and free text gray robes have diptychs as well. Rosemind's starting a trend in the temple, especially among those who have work. Once in the castle, Riarda informs Ferdinand and Rosemind of their schedules. Ferdinand will perform the baptism ceremony because Rosemind will be busy during her debut because, yeah, they do hold a baptism ceremony for those reaching seven in winter, and then those kids are lucky enough to have their debut right after. She wanted to sell some illustrations of Ferdinand during that, but he shot that down, of course. She's also scheming how to get some illustrations to her backers during a tea party, so look forward to that later. But Riarda snaps her back and tells her to focus, because she'll be performing a song to the gods during her debut. Oh, I'm sure that's gonna go so well with zero complications. The hierarchy for this is important, as with all noble crap to be honest. Lay nobles perform first, followed by med nobles, then arch nobles, and lastly followed by children of the archduke. Rosemine assumes that Wilfried's gonna go last because she's adopted and he's the heir apparent. It only makes sense, but they say she's gonna perform last because there's technically no hierarchy among the archduke's children. 
Now the real reason is, is he's gonna look bad if he has to follow up after her, because he's just barely scraping by while she's busy creating new songs with the help of Ferdinand and Rosina. After the debut in baptisms, socializing kicks off in full force, meaning Rosemine will be bombarded with meeting requests, and Ferdinand orders her not to talk to any noble she doesn't know. Just let her attendants handle that, so she's gonna need to stay in her room no matter what. Even if she wants books, those need to be brought to her, and also get approval for all of the meetings she plans on scheduling from her guardian trio. So once that's settled, she goes to check on Wilfred to see how he's doing, and he's almost done with his checklist. Note he's almost done. He still has five left to accomplish, but he's not too worried. Mostly because he's so close to being done, why stress about it, right? In other words, he's getting complacent. So Rosemond gives him a kick in the rear and says he won't make it with three days left and five tasks to do. That gets him fired up, and he jumps at it with Moritz. At dinner, he's accomplished another goal, and Rosemond taunts him a bit more to keep that motivation rolling. Sylvester's not feeling it though, and asks Rosemond to hand Ferdinand back over, as work has been piling up due to the discussion at the end of last volume. He's been declining to help without her permission. To make sure he doesn't get that permission, he says that she's been busy or absent, so he's not even asking. Rosemine says that she's not going to make him, as that would just reset the situation, and Sylvester's scholars need to learn to work themselves. Ferdinand is currently busy training some replacements, so she points out that the purge after the Civil War left Aaronfest mostly unscathed, aside from sending some nobles and priests to the Sovereignty to replace those that were killed, so they really shouldn't be hurting that bad. Rosemine really doesn't know how bad it is at this point. The Civil War caused a huge shift in nobility, from capable nobles being sent to the Sovereignty to maintain the country's magic tools and royal academy, older, more capable blue priests being sent over to maintain the church that's causing problems for the current king, and finally the return of the younger blue robes to noble society, all to fill the gap left by those taken to the Sovereignty, and they were rushed through the Royal Academy. And this is on top of a massive restructuring of the Royal Academy's curriculum. Nobility nationwide is struggling more than she realizes at this point. Hell, the country's on the verge of collapse. But she ends by saying that any scholars that need some advice can come on down to the temple and ask Ferdinand. That's basically a refusal as they're not going. On the morning of the debut, she's prepped early and heads to the hall. She notices Cornelius and Angelica are wearing matching capes and asks if those are for knights. Now she's only ever seen knights wearing dark yellow capes, so that's her experience. But it's part of the uniform for the Royal Academy. Sylvester hands those and a brooch over to all nobles ten years of age during the winter before they depart. That dark yellow is the official color of Aaronfest, and marks students as from that duchy, meaning other duchies have different color capes. It's probably worth noting at this point, after ten volumes, that Ferdinand's wearing a blue cape. That seems like a small detail right now, but trust me, it plays a bigger role later on. It really demonstrates the long haul of this series' storytelling. As she waits, other children arrive for their debut. But one girl catches Rosemine's attention and she waves. But the girl looks sort of awkward and averts her eyes. Now, she was told not to talk to any of these kids because that could impact politics. So, she takes that to mean that she shouldn't interact. So it's time for the baptism, and Rosemine and Wilfried walk in together to a huge gathering of nobles. After Ferdinand introduces them, of course, they take a seat and the eight kids are lined up on stage. It's worth noting that Elvira and Eckhart don't get to be with everyone else. Since Cardstead is guarding Sylvester, Cornelius and Angelica are up front for Rosemine, and Lamprecht is up front for Wilfried, meaning they're just with the regular Archnobles. That makes her kinda sad, because they don't get to be with the rest of their family, and they're kinda not her family anymore. You know, since she's been adopted by Sylvester. But the ceremony begins with four kids being baptized, who were either born in this season, or were too far away to invite priests over for a ceremony. Of them, a girl, the one Rosemine waved to, is up first. Felina. Rosemine is seeing the ceremony from an outside perspective now. As she grips the tool to make it shine, all the nobles clap, leading her to believe that if one can't make it shine, they won't be accepted as a noble. Obviously. But kids have their mana measured at birth, so it's pretty doubtful anyone would get this far and fail. Her father steps up and gives her a ring, and Ferdinand blesses her and receives a small blessing back. Rosemine is shocked that people are clapping for that tiny blessing, and then realizes just how absurd hers must have looked during her ceremony, going from a tiny blessing for the priest to suddenly blessing the entire room. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. After all four kids are baptized, it's time for the debut, and Felina is called up first. Again. Meaning she's the lowest in status, and therefore lay noble. 
Now she's abysmal at playing, making Rosemine wonder why the hell she and Wilfried were drilled so hard, especially after halfway through all the performances. The kids have all sucked. That is until the next few play, and they're marginally better, with the last few being passable. Meaning that's what's expected of a lay noble, med noble, and arch noble respectively. So when Wilfried plays acceptably, his performance just barely passes for his status. And now Rosemine realizes why lay nobles play first, so they don't look so bad in comparison to arch nobles. After Wilfried stumbles a few times, but still finishes his song, Florencia is looking on pretty happy. But it's Rosemine's turn now. Sylvester hypes her up by explaining why exactly she was adopted, and Rosina hands her an instrument, reminding her to smile and thank the gods while playing. That was a mistake. Rosemine prays while playing one of her original songs, and fires off a blessing doing so. That's clearly not normal, as not only is she shocked because she didn't mean to, but so is everyone else in the hall. Unsure what to do exactly, she finishes her song, Fernand strolls right on up to her and holds her up like Simba, and says behold, the Saint of Arenfest, before throwing her out of the hall while Sylvester capitalizes. Once out of the hall, Ferdinand shoves a sound blocking magic tool in her hand and demands an explanation, but she doesn't have one. So he says never pray while playing again because that's just gonna cause some fucking problems. Riarda says this demonstrates how she's a worthy member of the Archduke's family, you know, blessing the whole hall and everything. But Ferdinand is more concerned that if Rosemine doesn't make herself useful to the duchy, she might just be ostracized for having so much mana and being a freak. I don't think that's going to be a problem here. After lunch is served, Rosemine goes back in the hall and sees Rosina is a little off. Turns out she was approached by Christine, who was happy to see her and also a little sad. Apparently she planned on coming back for Rosina at some point. Rosemine's feeling a little jealous and kind of worried, but Rosina tells her not to worry. She's always going to serve her because she's her master. She feels relieved here because she thought that Christine abandoned her. Turns out she didn't. Now it's time for the gifting ceremony where capes are given out to the new students for the Royal Academy. They don't all leave on the same day to avoid overcrowding, so the older students go first and the youngest go last. Rosemine asks Ferdinand where the Academy is. It's in the Sovereignty, and he explains that it's in the center of the country under the direct rule of the king, basically pretty similar to the central district of Arenfest. The kids are taken there by a magic circle that's designed as such, so it can't move a ton of people at once. <laughs> that's a security measure, mostly to avoid an invasion by a duchy in case of a rebellion. After the gifting ceremony, the gathering turns social, meaning everyone suddenly notices how unwell Rosemine looks. So they shoo her on out to go to bed. Socializing is a huge deal among nobles. Gibbs talk about neighboring duchies, while the Archduke brings back news from the sovereignty that he learned during the Archduke conference as well as students sharing what they've learned from other duchies from their time in the academy. However, the baptized kids are thrown into the playroom, which usually amounts to the arch-nobles bullying the lay med-nobles with their status. Though, ostensibly, it's to build connections, learn how society works, and for higher-status kids to find future retainers. Enter Rosemine, whose idea it is to turn this dynamic on its head, as higher-status nobles bullying lower-status nobles doesn't suit her ends. She's first greeted by literally everyone there because of her status, in the first few days are the baptized kids asking the older ones about the Royal Academy to get a feel for their future. Do they want to be knights, scholars, or attendants? Their family tends to influence that, but not always, as we see with Daniel being a knight and his older brother being a scholar. Speaking of that, she asks her retainers why they chose to be knights. Daniel wanted a different information network than his brothers, Bridget was always athletic and liked the praise she got from fighting Fabies when she was younger, Cornelius is following family traditions, and Angelica's true colors finally show here. She answers in all seriousness that she doesn't like to study. She thought the Knights course didn't have any of that. How wrong she was. And strongly implies that Rosemine should do her thinking for her. Rosemine says she wants to be a scholar when she attends the Royal Academy, and Bridget has the unfortunate task of telling her that she has to take the Archduke candidate course, because all children of the Archduke are qualified to be in the running for that seat, so they all need educated as such. This practically breaks her little heart, especially when no one tells her she could still become a librarian. What happens when Rosemine's emotions go crazy? She passes out, of course. Ferdinand's there to scold her when she wakes up, and her first question is if she really can't become a librarian. Law dictates that she has to take the Archduke candidate course, but nothing's really barring her from taking multiple courses. Though no, that's basically like double majoring in college. Ferdinand himself took the Archduke, Scholar, and Knights course, only skipping the Attendance course. So, it's entirely possible, and Rosemine reluctantly jumps at the chance to still get her librarian cred in her second or third life, depending on your perspective. Hey, so we finally get why Ferdinand is so capable, all with administrative work, paperwork, as well as grunt work. 
because he's literally taken every course on how to do every meaningful job in the duchy. It also explains why Sylvester and Karstadt rely on him so much. The older students have now left, so it's just those under 10 in the playroom. Rosemine busts out some Karuta and playing card decks to teach the kids to read and do math ahead of schedule. She breaks the kids up by age rather than status or faction, and she and Wilfried win easily. That's a problem. So she says that if people aren't playing seriously, they won't have a chance to become their retainers. And also for a little bit of extra incentive, she's offering new sweets as prizes. Understand that the playroom operates on temple logic for how food is distributed, with arch nobles eating first and passing it on down the line. After that, she introduces reading and harspiel practice, as well as lessons with Moritz to bring the entire duchy's grade up when this group of kids goes to the academy. Felina loves the picture books, and when she learns that Rosemine made them, is starstruck and declares that she wants to make books too. This is when Rosemine starts seeding getting stories from other nobles, and gets some from Felina while she transcribes them. The playroom isn't the only place with major plays, as the duchy's politics are in shambles with Veronica being imprisoned at the end of last spring. So Rosemine is getting meeting requests left and right, with a special emphasis on avoiding the onslaught of those from Rosemary's family. Since she's being passed off as her biological daughter, but that information's not been made public at this point, they want to assert their place in society, so it's good to avoid them. Especially as far as nobles are concerned, Elvira's the one who claimed her at her baptism, meaning she's her daughter legally, or was at least until Sylvester adopted her and Florencia became her legal mother. But that's for later, because she's planning on meeting with Elvira's faction to deliver a report on the finances they supported. She also wants to meet with Henrik, Daniel's brother, and Guy Bildner to discuss a future visit and expansion for the printing industry. Riarda informs her that she'll have to meet with Angelica's parents as well, since otherwise, she'd be meeting with every retainer's family but hers. That'd look pretty bad, so she sends a request. <laughs> Let's rapid fire this. Henrix is pretty uneventful as he focuses on apologizing for Daniel's blunder and thanks her for putting in a good word for him when he was being punished because that saved their whole family. Daniel was pretty stressed about this. Guy Bilgner goes exceedingly well, but with the vague promise of sometime in the future going for a visit to his province. That way they can set up a paper factory. Directly after that meeting, the aforementioned issue with Rosemary's family rears its ugly head, and Rosemine follows Ferdinand's advice, and ignores them with Riarda giving her a pat on the back. Angelica's family's more comical as they immediately beg for forgiveness, as well as accepting their daughter being dismissed as a retainer. Rosemine's obviously confused about this, but they assume that since they got a request for a meeting, Angelica must have fucked up. Yeah, they've been planning for this. Rosemine informs them that she didn't in fact fuck up, but we learn that they've been expecting her to fail because they're a family of attendants, and Angelica chose to be a knight. Lastly is the tea party with Elvira and Florencia's faction. Nobody there really gives a shit about the report on how the money was spent after the Harspiel concert, and are more upset that illustrations aren't being sold, considering Ferdinand put a moratorium on that. However, Rosemine has a trick up her sleeve. If they fold the reports like a shuriken, it'll make an illustration of Ferdinand. So she goes ahead and teaches how to fold origami to horny housewives. And that's that. With socializing out of the way, the next dedication ritual is coming soon. Before she leaves, she gives Felina a story to transcribe while she's gone. And a few other girls in the playroom approach her to tell her stories as well. We learn that the Bibles are fine and all, but the girls really want more night stories. On the way to the temple, Rosemine is bundled up in multiple layers to protect her against the blizzard, but Ferdinand and Daniel just have armor. It's actually a magic tool that's weather resistant, so... They're perfectly fine just wearing that. At the temple, the two blue robes got the ritual set up just fine, and Sylvester's solution to the chalices was to give them two face stones charged with mana that Freetack and Camphor join in with Rosemine and Ferdinand for the dedication with. Whose mana is it? Well, considering they have two arch noble prisoners they can't kill, they have the mana to offer for Fren Beltag's extra chalices. This is great, because the ritual's now not going to take as long this year. When you have four arch nobles doing it, it's not that bad. Rosemine remembers that Aaronfest is supposedly on good terms with Frembeltag, and Ferdinand reaffirms this. But Sylvester and Florencia are particularly weak to their requests for help. Well, why is that? Turns out Sylvester's older sister was married to the Archduke of Frembeltag, and Florencia's brother is the Archduke, meaning Frembeltag's Archducal couple is both their older siblings. That's why they tend to give in to their requests. Ferdinand was pretty happy Rosemine stood up to Sylvester this year, as it lessened his load. He's been having to fill those chalices by himself for a few years. Since the dedication ritual is going so well, Rosemine will be heading back to the castle shortly. However, she's handed a stack of documents by Fran. In them is a letter to Beze wants. She reads it, and it's from the secret lover Rosemine thinks he had. So she replies as she always did, first with an introduction, and then that he climbed the towering staircase. 
When she puts the letter in the envelope provided, her mana is sucked out and the envelope turns into a bird like an ordnance, then flies away. <laughs> that startles her, and Bridget jumps in like a good knight and asks what the hell happened. Turns out there's magic tools like that, which are pretty damn helpful for sending messages to pre-Royal Academy children, or more realistically, to give orders to devouring soldiers. I guess it works just fine for communicating with clergy. Suddenly she's worried she may have just told someone something she shouldn't have, so she makes a mental note to inform Ferdinand when the ritual ends. Which, of course, means she's gonna be fretting over how bad she fucked up. Now all the nobles have been informed in the duchy, but what if Bezewant's death was meant to be kept under wraps from nobles outside? She has no clue. But then a similar bird flies in, smaller than the usual ordinance, and instead of verbally relaying its message, it turns into two sheets of parchment. One was her reply, but the second was a polite letter thanking her for informing the woman. Since she wasn't given more parchment, her reply wasn't expected. Great. So she hears that the priests are leaving the hall for the day, and decides to pop on over to Ferdinand's room. He's visibly exhausted when she tries to broach the subject, and just tells her to reply how she always has to questions about Bezewanst. He informs her that there isn't a gag order outside the duchy, so she's not going to be telling anybody anything secret. So she safely assumes she's in the clear. Except she failed to mention the notably magical letter she received, as well as that whole preceding correspondence between this woman and Bezewanst. That might be important by now. You don't think that's going to come back and bite her in the ass, do you? Of course it is. A noble woman outside the duchy has been contacting Peze wants for emotional support for years, and suddenly she finds out he's dead? Yeah, it's not going to end with just a letter. Such a simple mistake will lead to huge repercussions that will influence the conclusion of this part, as well as Rosemine's life for the next few years. I'm just proud I managed to say that with a straight face. I just love how small stuff like this is the domino effect that leads to huge shifts in this story's landscape over a few volumes. So in three days, as Ferdinand predicted, the dedication ritual is over. She has to secure the chalices in her chambers, and Ferdinand enters and thrusts Leidenshaft's spear into her hand, telling her she needs to fill it with mana. This is going to be her weapon when the time comes, despite her misgivings about using a holy relic. But after she's filled it with mana and visited the orphanage for some updates from Gil, Lutz, and Wilma, as well as learning how the Haas orphans have been doing, she heads back to Ferdinand to say they can go to the castle whenever he's ready. Unfortunately, her castle trip just got postponed, because an ordinance flies in and announces that the Lord of Winter has appeared. So real quick here, the Lord of Winter is a massive fey beast that has devoured countless others to build its mana, and due to its elemental affinity, it spawns endless blizzards that plague Arrenfest. The reason Winter's been so bad in this series to this point is there's a giant monster out there throwing snowstorms around, and it's the job of the Knight's Order to go ahead and kill it and bring spring. Why is Rosemine and Ferdinand being informed? Don't they have, like, literally every noble in the duchy there, so the Knight's Order is pretty much at full capacity? Well, the Lord of Winter's Facestone is very pure in Earth mana, so Rosemine needs it for her Jareef. Yeah, killing this giant-ass thing? That's her winter ingredient. This sucks for the duchy, since this Fey Beast hunt tends to provide a ton of materials. And remember that when a Facestone is taken from a Fey Beast, it melts into nothing. They're losing out on all the treasure here, so she's being pretty damn greedy with this. Rosemine is taken back to her chambers to get dressed, and go hunt this thing using a divine instrument as her weapon. Once everyone is ready, they fly to the training ground, and Rosemine blesses the entire order for maximum fighting potential. Then they head out. Their target is the Schneestrom this year, and is considered a strong Lord of Winter. Wow, who'd have thought? That name translates to Blizzard from German. The Arch Knights will be taking the charge in dealing damage, the Med Knights will take care of the minions it spawns, and the Lay Knights will be guarding Rosemine. She's ordered to stay in her high beast at all times during this fight and wait until she's retrieved by Ferdinand to deliver the killing blow. Everyone flies out to meet this thing, and it's actually a really boring fight from Rosemine's perspective. Yeah, she's staring at a wall of snow, with occasional flashes of magic peeking through. Though the blizzard fades as it loses mana, and we learn that it's basically a giant white tiger-like creature. After that, it'll rebuild the blizzard, and this fight takes literal days on any other given year, but not this time. Due to Rosemine's blessing and the efforts of the knights, they suffer a leg clean off, but it's not down for the count as it starts to heal. Ferdinand comes and grabs Rosemine, flying her up high on his high beast before they do a dive bomb attack. He orders her to pour all her mana into the spear, despite it already being full, and strangely, it keeps taking the mana, building until it's shining and Ferdinand helps her aim. The spear launches, becoming like a shooting star, and hits the Schneestrom, killing it dead. When they drop down into the crater made by the impact, the body is already gone, but the spear is unharmed and embedded in the Feystone. That attack not only killed it, but died the Feystone for her too, and so marks the gradual end of winter. 
Hooray. Sunny days become more common and Rosemine heads back to the castle. Since classes are wrapping up, some of the Royal Academy students come back for socializing and meetings. So, during their downtime, they end up back in the playroom. They get their asses kicked by their younger siblings at these new games, and suddenly they have something to work towards. Cornelius asks her where she got the karate, and she says she made them for study purposes, and it confirms that this stuff is learned in the Royal Academy. Specifically, the subordinate god names are what Cornelius is meant to learn next year, his third year in the academy. This stuff won't just give the kids a head start, but an easy first few years. She schedules a meeting with Sylvester to report the playroom status, and he's quite pleased that even the lay nobles are proficient in everything now. Rosemont confirms the class for learning the names of the gods, and she hears it's a pain since most of them aren't even used often. She informs Sylvester that Wilfried is even more familiar with the gods than the children currently taking that class. That's a huge surprise, and a pleasant one at that. So she asks permission to bring the Gilberta Company in to sell karate, playing cards, and Bibles. And Sylvester goes ahead and gives his permission, but wants a heads up so he can ensure that a bunch of nobles are there to maximize sales, though she wants to prioritize nobles with children. The next topic is her recipes have been really popular this winter, so Sylvester wants a convenient way to teach them. She thinks a recipe book would do well, but she plans on selling that for less than what her guardians paid for all those same recipes. She brushes that off, saying that their chefs are personally trained, and her recipes were plenty complicated. Just reading them isn't necessarily going to make them the same. Next is Haas, and Sylvester wants to hear her plan. She's thinking that just holding back spring prayer is going to be enough, but he shoots that down. She then suggests a tax hike for 10 years, and Sylvester says killing them might actually be a mercy at this rate, so it's decided. No spring prayer, an increased tax rate, and the mayor's faction is going to be executed for attacking the Archduke's family. And speaking of prayer, the land she blessed last year had better yields this year, so he wants her to bless the central district again. It's been lacking compared to the landowning Gibbs, since they throw in their own mana as well. Central district is now on par, so that's pretty huge. With the meeting over, she heads on back to the playroom and announces she'll be selling the educational stuff. The kids are all stoked, except Felina. Back at the temple, Lutz brings Benno to the hidden room, and they get down to business. She assumed Benno would jump at this chance, but his current staff isn't trained enough to handle the castle. But she has a plan. They're only selling pre-made stuff, not handling a ton of custom orders. That's not really ever done with nobles, but this stuff is expensive already, and pretty much the arch nobles are going to be the only ones ordering custom stuff. So Benno and Mark can handle them, while her attendants are the ones selling the pre-made stuff. Fran will be bringing the Frembel tag chalices anyway, so adding Fritz is going to cover their ass. But Tamiel's being a bit of a sad sack here, and points out that lay nobles still won't be able to afford anything. So, having been in their position, he feels pretty bad. Enter Rosemine's revolutionary ideas, lending them out. The concept already exists in this world, but Rosemine plans to lower the cost to essentially free. She'll be paid in transcribed stories and charge the parents for damages to the product. The day comes and they head to the castle, where Rosemine dumps the Gilberta company and her attendants off at the back door she usually uses. That's frowned upon, and Norbert and Ferdinand inform her she should have used the servant's entrance for them. But too late now. In the playroom, she has Wilfried demonstrate the Karuda, the random girls read aloud, and Cornelius play cards to demonstrate the games to their parents, so they can see their kids' growth firsthand, as well as the value this'll bring. That goes off without a hitch, and the products are set up for sale, with Rosemine and Wilfried having lines to greet the nobles attending with their families, almost segregating by sex for the kids, mostly for having a higher chance of becoming their retainers. Names that stand out here are Guy Groschel and his daughter with red hair. She's not given a name yet, but we'll get to know her pretty well in part four. This is also Bezewan's family that turned his shit down. Then there's Guy Kernberger in front of Wilfried, and that's another name that'll be relevant in part four. You know, it's pretty cool to see them mentioned here as a bit of continuity. At this point, these people mean literally nothing to Rosemine. But when we see them later, their devotion becomes apparent. They're starstruck by her from this winter onward. So just keep these names in mind as we venture down this rabbit hole. Once the goods are sold, most people have something. With the Arch Nobles buying one of everything, Med Nobles buying a few of some things, and Lay Nobles maybe buying one of a thing. But then there's poor Felina. Rosemine approaches her since she knows she liked reading and asks her if she'd be interested in a loaned book. She declines because her family can't even afford that, but Rosemine tells her it'll just cost her the verbal stories her mother told her, and as long as it isn't damaged, she won't have to pay a thing. Felina's already given her three stories, so Rosemine will be lending her three books. Other kids jump on this too, and this ensures that even the poorest kids have something to learn with. Oh, and Elvira shows up to do some Rinchan business with Benno, in front of all these nobles, securing Benno a ton more business. Yeah, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. 
so he's pretty conflicted about all the attention. After the sales, it's sunny out, so the noble children can actually go outside and play in the snow. Didn't realize that was something they were allowed to do, but hey. Rosemine heads out and decides to participate in a snowball fight, only to be beamed in the back of the head before she can even make one. So she's knocked unconscious and wakes up with a fever. That's the end of her winter. After classes end, there's a graduation ceremony at the academy with the parents attending. But when everyone comes back, there's an end of winter feast that we've already heard about. You know, the one Beze wants didn't attend last year, leading to Bindewal messing up his initial entry attempt? Yeah, it's that feast. But before that, things seem to be going too well. So, Angelica's back. Rosemine gets a letter requesting a meeting from Angelica's parents. This isn't good. Turns out she failed her classes and will need remedial lessons. They're requesting that she's relieved of duty, essentially asking her to be fired for shaming Rosemine with her poor performance. What's that actually mean, though? Well, remedial lessons are a stain on one's reputation, and for retainers of the Archduke's family, they need to have top-notch grades, or else their positions will be called into question. Rosemine doesn't really see it like that, though, and says that if Angelica can pass her classes in spring, she'll keep her because she really doesn't see a reason to fire her. That's considered being too generous and borderline self-depreciating. Riarda says that she can do what she wants here because, honestly, Rosemine's not going to be around in spring. She's got spring prayer and gathering to do, so, yeah, Angelica won't be missed. So she decides to keep her, much to everyone's shock. I mean, the kids learned over winter. Surely Angelica can too, right? You know, it was about this point she realized she fucked up. Angelica isn't just your standard idiot. She's on another level. Like, so much so that you're going to hear a whistle if her head lines up at the wind just right. Yeah. She's that stupid. This girl can't hold on to information as dense beyond belief and expects her looks to carry her through life. She's just lucky she's so damn endearing. So Rosemine gathers her guard knights together, who are either taking the knight's course currently, or have already passed it. This is a study group to raise Angelica's grades, where she's offering things to her guards if they can get Angelica to pass. Recipes for Cornelius, money for Daniel, and a special, uh, to be determined for Bridget. However, Angelica is the one who's not motivated here, so she asks Angelica what she really wants to get her to pass. Angelica says she wants her mana, so this is a bit complicated. Angelica's growing a mana blade. It's this tiny little sword she has around her waist. It doesn't really look like it's much to write home about, but since she's so small, she uses enhancement magic to prioritize speed and make up for the power she lacks. Meaning, as a med noble, she can't really waste mana on creating a weapon with her stop. A mana blade is the solution here. And how to grow one, you obviously need mana, so she wants Rosemines for that. When Rosemine agrees, that gets Angelica pumped. So her studies begin, where she plays Karuta with the other knights, gets some practical experience using the book Lamprecht gave Rosemine back in volume one of this part. The practical part of that is using Gwenin for explanations in the book. That makes the written parts of these courses much more understandable. Rosemine's actually pretty decent at it too. Showing her studying with Ferdinand and Cardstead's books is actually making her a decent strategist. The Gwenin set is actually Daniel's though, which is odd since lay nobles generally don't have mana to play it, but even that's a bit of a lie. It's actually his brother's. Now he got it because he went to the academy when Ferdinand went, and Ferdinand made Gwenin really popular to explain strategies for Ditter. By the time Rosemine's going to attend, they expect the educational materials to be standard practice. Though Bridget does say they should probably sell them at a higher price to other duchies. That way Aaronfest can still maintain an edge. Now this brings up Aaronfest's place pre-Civil War. Currently it's ranked roughly in the middle due to its neutrality during the conflict. But before, it was pretty close to the bottom in terms of strength and influence, considering it's a pretty backwater duchy despite its size. Aaronfest's current rank is purely because other duchies fell in the rankings when they lost the war. So Rosemine thinks to keep the material secret, and Sylvester agrees. He announces that during the feast, that students should hide the existence of Karuta, playing cards, and books. With the nobles heading home, Rosemine goes back to the temple to perform her usual ceremonies for the lower city, which means it's officially spring. Ferdinand plans out spring prayer with her because she has the whole central district to hit up. But besides that, she has a spring ingredient to gather too. Since when were you under the impression it was just one per book? We're three out of five volumes into part three now, so she's got some catching up to do. She'll have Eckhart and Ferdinand with her since fall went oh so well. They're gonna ensure her safety. But Haas has some things moving as well. So they're bringing Eustace as a scholar to handle that specifically before he fucks off back to the noble quarter. Spring prayer is set, so now she heads to the orphanage director's chamber to meet the Gilberta company. Karina and Tully are there at her request too, because when they head into the hidden room, she invites Bridget and Monica in there for the first time, instead of her usual Damuel and Gil. Why is that? Because this isn't about paper, this is about Bridget's reward for helping her with Angelica. 
she's providing a new dress design with Karina's help, one that'll suit her body type more for the upcoming Starbine ceremony. This is of course the payoff for her talking about Bridget's outfit back in volume 1 of this part. Rosemind's introducing a halter style dress, <laughs> well one with some added cloth at least, all to ensure it meets this world's standards for fancy, and when it's all said and done, Bridget ends up pretty pleased with the design. She steps out to let them measure, and hears from Mark that things went well over in Haas when he went over to see how the rumors took hold. The farmers are supporting her over the mayor, because no spring prayer is the same as being abandoned by the Archduke in their eyes. So yeah, they're scared shitless, and the mayor's faction is thoroughly isolated. Mark also took the liberty of hitting home that they're sending knights and scholars this spring to arrest those responsible for the attack. That's actually pretty helpful. So time to head out, meaning the priests are going first to get the monastery set up. Martha and the Haas orphans are going with them, and feeling both happy to go home, and sad they're leaving their new friends. Obligatory fuck Delia, but Mark and Benno are there too with a letter from Sylvester informing the mayor when they'll arrive to dish out the punishment. Then a few days after that, they're going themselves. But Ferdinand, Eckhart, and Eustace stop by for lunch before they leave. They need to have a discussion about Haas. See, Rosemine is still upset that she has to deliver the news, but ultimately she sees saving the town as a good thing. The nobles not so much. She tries to reason, but they're bewildered she would even suggest trying to save them. Why would she, when they're traitors who could turn against the Archduke again? She tries to convince them with logic that, hey, these are taxpayers and money is good. After all, Ferdinand kind of hit her over the head with that last volume. But no. See, due to their mana shortage, one less town means less mana used during spring prayer, meaning these people and their money isn't even worth it. Especially when we see that the amount of mana poured into the land directly impacts the crop production. So one less Haas would mean they could pour more into the rest of the areas and not really see an impact. So yeah, Rosemond saving them has zero merit to the duchy. She has to accept that, and it's another harsh blow. I will say, I love how this series smacks back against common wisdom. It's, this is bad? But here's a logical path in this world why it's acceptable by their standards. And also throw in how our modern view is incredibly naive. It's some really great writing. <laughs> With our morals thoroughly questioned, they head to Haas, where Ferdinand is going to see just how many people this plot saved. Eustace asks to load a pretty important looking box into Rosemite's high beast, and that's a trap. He's not supposed to be separated from it. So now he has to ride and is incredibly impressed at the interior, annoying her the whole trip with questions. The town is tense and they arrive, and they get on stage. Richt is there to greet them, and everyone else is kneeling while waiting for the Archduke's judgment. But Rosemont can't change anything, and gives her sympathies as she explains the punishment. Attacking the monastery is treason against the Archduke. The mayor's the one who ordered it. Normally they'd all be six feet under right about now, but Rosemine saved them with only ten years of taxes and no spring prayer. The people are stoked about this, since many of the surrounding villages, like, weren't involved at all, and they would have just been collateral damage. But this isn't all. Ferdinand demands that the traitors be brought forward, and that's when the mayor's tossed on stage with them. We now get a pretty annoying game with him pleading dumb, that he just didn't know and he's trying to rely on Rosemine's sympathy, or rather manipulate her to get him off the hook. But she's not buying it. In fact, uh, she's pretty disgusted at this dude for making this scene, and shows the fruits of her labors with Ferdinand by laying a rhetorical trap. He proclaims that she's the saint who shows mercy to orphans, but she points out he's the one who beat them in the first place. He claims that's a punishment, but she just doesn't understand what would warrant such treatment. Seems pretty harsh, right? She asks what this dude would do if those orphans attacked his family, and he says he'd kill them. Even if they didn't know it was his family, it's no excuse in his eyes. And then she has him right there, as the dumbass hung himself with his own rope. Ferdinand gets to play the bad guy now in this massive charade. He asks Rosemine publicly if she, the saint, believes the city deserves mercy. She says it does, and Richt asks permission to speak, and says Haas understands what happened, and they won't go against the Archduke again. Ferdinand summons a yellow shield like shoots Arya's, but this one's not a dome, it's actually a rectangle like a door. It functions the same though, so those who harbor ill will, can't pass. Richt volunteers to walk through it, and though he's scared, he passes right through. Next they force the mayor through, and he bounces right off, showing he hasn't learned his damn lesson. Eckhart ties him up with bands of light, and Rosemine thinks it's over, but no. Ferdinand plans to make every single one of the people walk through this door of judgment. Now Richt is fine with this, as they'll purge those who will doom their city. In the end, the mayor, his wife, and four others weren't able to pass. Now we have an execution to do, because those who turn against the Archduke are killed. How's that? Get ready, because it's actually pretty damn scary. Ferdinand announces this to the crowd, and tells Rosemine not to look away. Eustace goes to the important box he brought and unlocks it. Inside is Haas's identification medals from their baptism, 
Generally, these aren't taken out of the castle, but since they didn't know how many they'd end up killing, they brought the whole towns. So Eckhart is guarding it when Eustace steps away to take a blood sample from the traitors. He then places it on a piece of parchment. This is to find the medals, since there's nothing written on them and they're registered with blood. During funerals outside the capital, blood is smeared on a board and given to the scholar during the harvest festival, and it's sent back with the harvest. And then the medal would be returned to the farming town with the board later. Mine's blood was taken for her funeral too, that way Ferdinand could give her original commoner medal. Eustace uses a spell to pull out the medals, and quite literally, they come flying out of the box when the parchment burns up. He then gives them to Ferdinand. Ferdinand commands Rosemine to step back because the spell he's casting is one to punish traitors. No one outside those who have graduated from the Archduke's course in the Royal Academy can learn it. This is the reason Eustace jumped on this assignment. This spell is pretty damn rare, and he wanted to see it cast firsthand pretty badly. He informs Rosemine that she'll be learning it herself in the Academy too. So that's going to be future PTSD material. So Ferdinand casts the spell, causing an ominous black circle to appear, and he throws the medals into it. Once that happens, he commands Eckhart to release the prisoners. The mayor cowers, the farmers try to flee, and his wife bum rushes the nobles for revenge. But it's too late. The metals inside the magic turn black and disintegrate, while the bodies of the traitors all turn to white stone. It's a painful process and stops them from moving, but slowly, they freeze solid. Once they're fully stone, their bodies fall, break apart, and blow away in the wind like ash. Traitors have no metals to pin to their graves. They leave no body. They're basically disowned by their duchy, in the good grace of the nobles that allowed them to live to that point. Richt kneels, and the town is grateful to be rid of the traitors. Rosemine wants to throw up, but she can't, and Ferdinand made her watch so she would know what's at stake from her careless actions later down the line. She has to address Haas one last time, and barely manages to tell them to endure for another year. If they're loyal next year, they'll get a spring prayer, so ultimately their fate is in their hands. Remember to be loyal. But the image of people dying so horribly haunts her when she closes her eyes. In the monastery when she goes to sleep, Gunther asks if she's cold, and offers her his cloak. Ferdinand tries to stop it, but she replies right away. And as weird as it is to her retainers, she sleeps wrapped in a random soldier's cloak. After Ferdinand uses a spell to clean it, of course. I mean, we all know it's her dad. It brings her some much needed comfort throughout the night, so it helps. She didn't have a single nightmare. The next morning, Rosemine wakes up well rested, folds Gunther's cloak, and has Ferdinand call him over to give it back. They subtly share a moment where he's relieved that she's fine, and she's just happy for that little bit of familial connection before they part ways. Now, Bridget notes that she's pretty close to that random soldier. Bit of a reminder though, she's the only noble there who doesn't know that's her actual dad, and Rosemine has a cover story already thought up. She says he's Tuli's dad, is close to the Gilberta company, and works with Karina's husband. He also used to service her guard when she would go play in the lower city for business before her baptism and also help the orphanage. It's decently well crafted, so Bridget buys it. They're resting one more day at the monastery before leaving for spring prayer with Ferdinand and Eckhart, but Eustace is traveling by carriage back to Ehrenfest to return the citizenship medals to the castle. When seeing everyone off though, she tells Benno about the yet to be determined trip to Ilgner, and he's letting some of his true feelings show a bit with some annoyance. Back in the hidden room, they talk about the ingredient they're going to gather. They're going to be hitting up a remote pond in the woods called the Goddess's Bath on the night of Flute Rane to gather the nectar of a flower called a Ryrain. Eustace has already scoped it out, and there he found Fabies known as Talfrosh. Since fall went so bad, they're not taking any chances, and Bridget's reaction to that name tells Rosemine all she needs to know. They're probably pretty fucking gross. After they hammer out the details, Ferdinand wants to talk to Rosemine alone, and clears out even the nobles to ask her what she learned from yesterday. She says she needs to learn noble culture ASAP, and Ferdinand agrees. Her problems here were not understanding the cultural importance of the ivory buildings, not understanding the difference in common sense between commoners and nobles, and not understanding the hospitality nobles are meant to be shown. So she has work to do. Though Ferdinand's just happy this wasn't a major incident, but she says it actually was. Though from his perspective, saving Haas from being obliterated was more of a pain in the ass than just destroying it, so they're gonna have to agree to disagree. She does feel now that instead of spreading printing as fast as possible, she should wait until people are ready for it, and in the meantime improve their process and paper. Also, maybe educate the mayors to avoid all this again. Ferdinand really doesn't see the merit, but when she lays out that Beze wants has probably twisted the views of nobility for commoners, he relents. But she's gonna have to be the one to actually educate them. Once they're outside the closest sphere of influence, mayors aren't as closely tied to Beze wants. Because hey, you know he didn't get fat by going away from the city very often. That requires exercise. The prayer march goes pretty well, 
and when they get to the town closest to the goddess's bath, they ask for some info. The mayor says the bath has some healing properties, so people pilgrimage to visit it. But if you don't leave sweets for the goddesses, they'll play a trick on you and you'll get lost. So Rosemine and her attendants plan to leave some special treats for a safe passage. Feeling a little Japanese now, aren't we? Now they were originally going to go by High Beast, but that didn't work too well. When they fly overhead, they can't find the bath. Rosemine sets down while Damuel, Ferdinand, and Eckhart go searching, and she spots a weather-worn goddess statue. There she places the sweets in front of it. Her and her attendants pray, and then they clean it up, right as the knights get back, and then they venture into the woods. During the hike, they see some random-ass babies and make Damuel kill them for practice. Ferdinand and Eckhart note how slow he is, and theorize that he prioritizes saving his mana as much as possible despite it still growing. In a clearing they decide his base camp, they're feeling a bit lost, until Rosemine points out some lights beyond a tree line. As they approach, the trees literally move out of their way, and they see a glowing pool of water. Inside are some gross looking toad creatures, or as anybody could have guessed, the Talfroshes. Rosemine's grossed out, but remarks to Daniel that these remind her of Bindewald. The two share a chuckle over that. These creatures eat each other to combine into a big one, and then it uses its tongue to snatch up Rosemine and Bridget in one gulp, but Bridget has a hold on her. So they're just chilling in this nasty ass mouth. She stabs the thing with her weapon, and it spits them out into the water. Rosemine splashes down, but it's actually pretty warm and strangely breathable. When she surfaces, the toad explodes into smaller toads, and they rain from the sky. One lands on Rosemine and she flips the fuck out, before Ferdinand yells at her to quit crying and stab it with her knife. This is how they have to be killed by getting them as small as possible and finishing off the whole group. They head back to camp where inside Lessie, Rosemine was given a magic tool that would keep it manifested. So she gets changed, they eat, and then pass out. That night though is pretty damn weird. They feel like Lessie is swaying back and forth, and when they wake up, they're at the bath again. But now there's some freaky glowing orbs surrounding the panda bus while the air is full of mana. These bubbles are making some strange chiming sounds, but they aren't really sure what they are. Rosina jumps up and plays the harspiel to accompany the sound, while all the girls who are sleeping in Lessie get out. Bridget sees some more Talfroshes and rushes over to kill them because they were eating the bubbles, and that made the bubbles pretty happy. So now that the danger is gone, they have themselves a little party, with music, sweets, and Rosemine starts singing. She's so enraptured by the fun, she sees the flower sprouting, and walks out onto a leaf that carries her up into the air. Right as the sun's coming up, she gathers the nectar into a jar, and then the leaf snaps. Suddenly she's crashing down to the ground as her senses come back. Luckily Ferdinand saves her ass at the last second, and scolds her hard for doing something so dangerous. He and the men were all stuck outside, prevented from entering by a wall of mana. Hell, the trees literally flung Lessie into the bath faster than Ferdinand and the others could move. They watched in horror as the girls disregarded safety and started having a party in the middle of a forest of strange shit happening. Then Rosemine got on that leaf and rode it up into the air as the flower bloomed, and she didn't think anything about it. Turns out all that mana fucked with their senses. Bridget even says that she was going to send an ordinance until she went outside, and suddenly none of that mattered. Ferdinand ends by saying that she shouldn't leave her high beast like that because inside, it's filled with her own mana to prevent that type of crap from even happening. Good news though is the nectar wasn't just successfully gathered, it was already died because she grew the flower with her own mana. But before they leave the bath, they want to gather some of that spring water to offer to the village as thanks for the info. Back at the temple, Ferdinand calls Rosemine into his hidden room, where he explains the nectar wasn't entirely dyed. With some effort, someone else can dye it with their mana. He's interested because this changes everything he knew about fey plants, and he wants to grow some for experiments. She's not about that life, and gets him to put it off for about 10 years down the line. That should be when the mana crisis is over, though she wants some compensation, and he says he could prepare more money than she'd even know what to do with. Remember, Ferdinand's fucking rich as shit, but anybody who's been following this series, money was a means to an end. She doesn't want that, she wants a fucking library. The epilogue this time is from Eckhart's perspective after spring prayer. He's at Ferdinand's estate for a chat eating cookies. He's curious why Ferdinand trusts Rosemine so much, because if you noticed, he let her handle all the food preparations during spring prayer, especially with what we know later on, considering how cautious Ferdinand was in the Royal Academy. He explains that she was raised in the temple, and lacks a purebred noble's penchant for deceit, but also, uh, he can't really tell Eckhart the whole story, that he's seen her memories and knows about her previous life. Enter Cardstead, who's there to discuss the gathering. Ferdinand goes mad scientist and wants to talk about the nectar, but they shut that down and are more interested in the divine instruments. Turns out Ferdinand read a document stating they could be used for practical purposes, 
<laughs> though it's not quite that simple, as it requires a fuckload of mana. Also, speaking of the winter hunt, he's wondering what happened to Rosemine's budget because she's been taking nobles for all their work. All to pay for the Schneestrom Facestone she took. But Ferdinand explains that she prefers to be self sufficient and isn't touching Cardstead or Sylvester's money. Now the topic moves to the last season they've yet to gather in. Summer's around the corner, and Cardstead wants to know the details because they have to gather a Riza Falca egg. They're giant birds who ease Leiden Shaft's anger. Now Eustace has gathered those eggs once before, and uh, it didn't go so well. So Eckhart's not really expecting Summer to go smoothly. So there's the main story for this volume, and rosemine has got a hell of a summer vacation ahead of her. But well, let's look at the side stories to cap off the content before we get ahead of ourselves. Let's begin with Winter Debut in the Playroom. At the debut, obviously, Lamprecht is watching Wilfried perform, and his retainers are all super proud because he managed to pull it off. That is until Rosemine steps up and blows everyone away with her blessing. That comes off as a kick in the ass to them, because it feels like a nasty trick by Sylvester and Ferdinand. When she's carried out, Lamprex suspects foul play, but he noticed Ferdinand rushed her out with an icy look on his face. So, he probably didn't plan this. A shout comes cheering for Rosemine, and it's Bonifatius. That's Cardstead's father, the former Knights Commander, and permanently banned from talking to her due to how overbearing and rough he is. But Wilfried wasn't as phased as everyone was worried about. He says Rosemine's pretty damn amazing and says his debut being so successful has made him hungry, so he gets something to eat. The retainers hold a meeting later to discuss what the hell happened. Some want to reach out to the former Veronica faction and gain their support for Wilfried, because the Lies gangs are wanting Rosemine to be the next Ob, and are already making moves. But Lamprex says to slow their roll. Politics are still in shambles after almost a year, so siding is actually going to hurt Wilfried more than anything. Instead of factions, they plan on securing as many good retainers for him as they can in the playroom, though some still worry that Rosemine's magnificent display will cause people to flock to her and make Wilfried look inferior. Lamprex says not to worry about her as an enemy, because they're too focused on her strengths and ignoring her glaring flaws. Chiefly among those is her poor health. What they should be working on is getting Rosemine and Wilfried to work together, marry, and eventually unify their power bases. Later before Cornelius leaves, Lamprecht asks him what his plans are to gather retainers for Rosemine, and uh, he's kinda confused. The thing is, he's not trying to. Hell, he's not even planning to stay her retainer. He's only doing it as a favor to their parents, and they told him not to look for others due to her not being in the running for awe. But he is curious. He asks Lamprecht why he chose to serve Wilfried. He says because Wilfrey needed him. He's also been doing a pretty shit job so far, so he doesn't really think he has a right to serve anyone else. Seems like Eckhart and Cardstead's undying loyalty to their masters has warped Cornelius' perspective on what a master-servant relationship should be like, and Lamprecht tells him to find his own reason to serve her, rather than base it off someone else's, though he's pretty sure Cornelius has already made up his mind. In the playroom, Rosemine's taken control of it and ordered the kids not to accommodate them, as we already know. Wilfried's retainers are impressed that she's managed to manipulate so many so easily, but Lamprecht isn't surprised. She worked with Maritz to make a plan for all the kids, and while they studied, she read thick books no one else could understand. She's basically ready for the Royal Academy at this point, and pretty much everyone else is gonna look inferior to her, but while she's away, Wilfried actually unites kids from different factions against her as a common enemy to be in Karuda. Lamprecht now sees that he's a real leader of nobles. The last one is the High Bishop's exclusive business, and uh, I already covered everything in it with Ingo, so I'm not gonna rehash it here. So that's it for content this volume. There's still a lot of events, and yeah, a little bit less lore, but I'm not opposed to that, especially since it lets the story catch up somewhat. But let's get into my thoughts and wrap up this video. It's quite long enough already. Last book had a ton of lore about the world baked into it, but this volume really puts a greater emphasis on the plot of this part, at least two important aspects of it, Rosemine's Gathering and Noble Debut. But this isn't to say that there's no lore, because we do get a little bit about the Divine Instruments, hints about the massive civil war that shook the country and they're still dealing with the ramifications of to this day, as well as the sprawling map of Sylvester's family drama that informs this duchy's politics slowly being unraveled bit by bit here. There's less breaks for, hey, this is why this religious ceremony we've been hearing about for five volumes is actually super important on very societal levels, and more sprinkling in of small details to get the interconnected feel that people love this franchise franchise 4. One of those was the through line with Haas, something that's been playing out for three volumes at this point. 
The initial inciting incident with the monastery builds to a conflict over the orphans, causing the transgression, learning why that's bigger than originally thought, the throwing of salt on the wound, and we're left with that to stew over winter. So we finally see the climax of her brushes with this town, after a whole book of agony and buildup. How does that hold up? Honestly, it's pretty good. Showing how little commoners mean to nobles, as they're basically the equivalent of cattle. Things that nobles let use their land to raise crops for them to eat, as well as pay taxes. But ultimately, they're the ones providing the raw materials for the farming and money generation with mana. The culture shock is interesting, because it's not just played high and mighty to say, look how evil these people are, while also attempting to get in the head of a realistic feudal ruling class. These dirty people are beneath them in their eyes, because they live off their mana. They only provide some meager money and food in return. And in fact, because of the mana shortage, some of them dying isn't a big deal. Eustace even talks about them like livestock in this book. How young they die, how easily they're wiped out by a little bit of disease, and how long it takes them to come of age and actually benefit the duchy. By the way, that's the one person backing up Rosemine when she's against nuking Haas. This conversation really gives a strong insight into a noble's mind, and I'm all for how it's executed. Though I think it would have been a cool, sort of terrifying moment if the powder people crumbled into during the execution turned out to be the dust required to construct the ivory buildings with magic. Now hear me out, because it's described as a shining powder, it turns everything it touches into white dust. Thematically, I think it would have been both chilling and powerful, like the traitors of the duchy become its literal foundation for the ruling class. That resonates for me. The mountain of corpses of people who stood against us are what makes this duchy strong. That type of thing. And we learn more about how duchies are formed, the process of a new Archduke ascending, and the show power for that is them expanding the central city with a new quarter. Now tell me that being fueled by the losers in a war wouldn't be a fitting display. It's mentioned later that this building creation spell, and Twink Ellen as we'll learn later, requires a lot of mana, and a particularly rare and expensive ingredient. Now don't get me wrong, the execution is still a powerful moment as presented in the story. It's damn disturbing without being gruesome. I just think it's a bit of a missed opportunity to maybe tie in some irony that the mayor attacked an ivory building, defied the Archduke, and his body becomes part of the duchy itself as punishment. Instead, the dust just blows away. Now that's not devoid of meaning in itself either, as the story reinforces that point by saying there's literally nothing left of traitors. No citizenship plate, body, or grave for those who betrayed the duchy. This scene shows how brutal this world can be, why nobles are so feared, the power they wield, and reinforces the role commoners play. Keeping that mindset of how disposable they are in the eyes of nobles, especially in the current point of the story. Also just how much this impacts Rosemine. This execution will stay with her through not just the rest of part three, but even going into part four. She talked with Ferdinand about what she learned, and it's less that this was something she deemed valuable, and more she wants to avoid seeing, or down the line a little bit, having to do to other people herself. She was teaching the mayors how to deal with nobles after this point, and is gonna release a book on etiquette to sell to town chiefs, all to avoid this specific mishap in the future. When she visits Ilgner next volume, Haas taints her perceptions, and sets in her mind from this point on how she needs to handle commoners, because she could get them killed in the most horrible way by not acting like a true noble. Rosemine already didn't like death in this book, and now she's terrified of what death actually is like in this world. Getting a little lighter in tone, I appreciate the world building with how winter works in this story. The idea that the god of life has imprisoned the goddess of earth and ice, and that's what leads to the end of crop growth, but also explaining the cold, and that manifests with Fabies running rampant, devouring each other due to the lack of food, until they become raid bosses that throw blizzards at cities, is a really interesting fantasy explanation for a natural phenomenon. The stronger this thing is, the longer winter is, because the knights have to fight longer to kill it and end the constant snowstorms. We'll see later how even commoners can help out doing this in part 4, that thinning the Fey Beast population throughout the year will curb the Lord of Winter's power. And speaking of the gods, how real they are and just how they impact the world is pretty damn intriguing. We saw it with the Knight of Shudzari in the last volume, that the purple moonlight causes certain fey plants and fey beasts to change their behavior, or how they can create mana-rich areas that play with people's minds. That certain spells and prayers may even inhibit that mana, because you're getting the god in question's blessing, and yeah, that would kind of make sense that it's going to filter out that god's mana. That really cracks open the magic system for a lot of ways mana interacts with the world. Tidbits like this are what gets me excited to read this series again, because you notice different information in scenes that recontextualizes other parts of the story. It's really well done. So that's it. Rosemine managed to gather two of the four ingredients to fix her body with this potion, as well as dealt with Haas like a true noble. 
now faces down a threat in summer for her ingredient, as well as an ominous air coming across the southern border of Arenfest. All because, remember, she sent that reply about Beze Wants death. Next volume is the penultimate one in this part, where we finally learn about Ilgner, get to hear more about the Archduke Conference, and a treacherous mountain climb to secure her future. But for now, hey, you've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description. If you'd really like to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to HonorWolf01 for their continued support. Thanks for watching.